Hello. You are listening to the Grieving Parents Sharing Hope podcast. We are here to walk with parents on their unwanted journey of child loss, guiding them to a place of hope, light, and purpose, not in spite of their child's death, but as a way to honor his or her life. And now, here is your host, author, speaker, and bereaved parent, Laura Deal. Hi. This past Sunday was what we call Palm Sunday, and obviously this coming Sunday, at least when this episode is being released, is Easter Sunday, when we celebrate the fact that Jesus could not stay dead in the grave. For those of us who have lost a child, this is worth celebrating, especially since it made a way for our children to still be alive and are in heaven waiting for us. Now, if this is something you struggle with, One of the very early podcasts, I brought on a guest, Pastor Lynn Breeden, where we talk about this fear and why you can be set free from it. This episode 18, and I'll put a link to it in the show notes. If you need to pause this right now and go listen to it before continuing, please do that. It's a short one. It's only 21 minutes, but it's very powerful. If you are like me, I want to celebrate this, but I don't necessarily want to go to an organized church service to do it. It just feels so religious to me to sit in a church service for Easter Sunday, and this is so very personal for me now. And I'm not talking about like denomination religion. I'm just talking about you sing the same songs and you hear a message and I don't know, it just, it feels like the same old, same old, and I, I, I need the freshness, I need the realness, I, I just, I need more than that. For those who have a fantastic body of believers, and you can hardly wait to join them on Easter Sunday, I am thrilled for you, I really am. But unfortunately, that just isn't typical for most perivers. Weekly church services feel shallow and empty for the most part. We need something deeper, more raw and real than what happens weekly in a building and this, you know, set of traditional way we do things. And even if you're a non-denominational, there's still a traditional way of doing things. You sing your songs, you have your offering or your announcements, your little video announcements, and then you have your message and then you have a prayer team up front. You know, whatever it looks like, there's still, I don't know, there's just a traditional religious kind of thing that comes with it. And I'm not saying that's bad. I mean, I, I've been part of a church. I grew up in the church. I'm, I'm a pastor's kid, a PK. I'm an ordained pastor. I'm not church bashing here. I'm just saying that for most of us who've lost a child, attending a weekly service, just it just doesn't do it for us. Our needs are so deep, and we just need more than that weekly, you know, showing up every week at a church service. You know, I I guess I really can't say more about that at this point, but I I want to use today for all of us to come together to be able to celebrate the depth of what God did for us through Jesus and his resurrection from the dead, especially if you're someone who you want to do something, you want to think about this, and maybe you want to know you're with other believers, other perivers who believe in the resurrection and want to celebrate it, but maybe you just feel like you can't go to church for whatever reason it is. Let's start with the verse we hear this time every year, it seems like, which is one I struggled with after Becca died. It's 1 Corinthians 15, 55, and it says, Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Well, I can tell you exactly where death's sting is after the death of my daughter, and I'm sure you can too. I begged the Holy Spirit to please explain this to me. I know his word is true, but this just wasn't true in my life, not even close. God didn't answer that prayer right away. But one day when it wasn't even on my mind, he began to speak to me about it, and I would like to share that with you. Whenever we're dealing with a bee sting, one of the first things we need to do is to make sure we get the stinger out of the skin. My understanding is that sometimes the stinger remains in the skin and continues to release its poison until it's pulled out. 
Now, right now, we have the stinger in us. The pain from the poison of our child's death is still affecting us, and it's going to continue until we join our child on the other side of eternity. And that is where the sting of death will be pulled from us, and we will no longer be under the effect of that poison and continue feeling the pain of our child's death. As I pulled out my Bible and I read the scripture in multiple versions, I discovered what the Holy Spirit had spoken to my heart is exactly what this verse means. The contemporary English version puts it this way. I'm going to read a little bit around that verse here. It says, Our dead and decaying bodies will be changed into bodies that won't die and won't decay. The bodies we have now are weak and can die, but they will be changed into bodies that are eternal. And then the scriptures will come true. Death has lost the battle. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Death, you have lost the battle. You've lost the power to hurt us. It's gone. The stinger has been pulled. It actually says that. Right in this contemporary English version, it actually says the stinger has been pulled. I know this doesn't help for the sting that you're feeling right now, but there will come a time when this scripture will become true in our lives. Let me just say, though, that the poison that makes it hurt so bad, it can be lessened while we are here on this earth. Let me see if I can help with this, even if it's just a little bit. During a worship song at a church service one day, and yes, this was after Becca died, and like I said, yes, I did go back to church for quite a while, and I was ministered to in many ways. I realized that if I bring God into my battle, including the battle of my fears and my darkness, then I will win because it's impossible for God to lose. He is the Alpha and Omega. Jesus is the beginning and the end. God has the first and the last word in my life, and he also has it in the life of my child. God has never entered a battle where he came out as the loser, and he never will. As soon as I see God on my side and not as the enemy and ask him to fight my battle for me, I know that somehow I will come out victorious. Now, I never thought about it until Becca died, but the very first person on this earth to die was who? It was Abel, the son of Adam and Eve. He was murdered by his own brother. Think about that. Nobody had ever died before. Adam and Eve probably weren't even sure what that meant when God said, this is, this is what's going to happen now. You're going to die. I mean, they may not even understood fully what that meant. And so to have the first person die to be, you would think it would be Adam or Eve, but it wasn't. It was one of their sons, and it was by the hand of another son. So a child dying before the parent dies has been happening literally since man was created, and Satan came, and there was the corruption of mankind. So what this tells me is that absolutely no one is exempt from the possibility. The thing is, even before creation, God had a plan to win the war Satan started. Just this week, I heard someone say that we are in the midst of a love story, but it is set in the midst of war. Wars have many battles, and each battle is different. War also has civilian casualties quite often. Anyone who lives on this earth is a participant in this war. Whether you realize it or not, whether you want to believe it or not, every single human being is a participant in the war that's going on here on this earth. In 2 Timothy 2, 3, Paul talks about suffering as a soldier in Christ's army. And in a war, whether a soldier or a civilian, some walk away with only minor injuries and setbacks, 
Some are injured for life and some lose their lives. It's the same in the spiritual realm. There are many battles and each battle is different. There are soldiers and there are civilians. There are some who walk away with minor injuries and setbacks. Some are affected for the rest of their time here and some lose their lives here on earth. However, the final outcome is that he will win the war, and we are on the winning side. This isn't permanent. You will come out victorious. If not here, then when you become a casualty of war and you get to leave this earthly battleground. It may feel like the war has been lost and God did not fight for you, but remember that this is only one battle. I know it feels like the wounds from this battle will never heal and you are out of commission for the rest of your time here on earth. And I'm here to tell you that is only true if you give up and accept that as your fate. Jesus is the captain of the hosts of heaven. And if you let him, he will lead you into a place of victory and triumph over the enemy who took out your child from this earth. He is alive to be able to do this. And that's a reason to celebrate the resurrection day of Jesus. Ephesians 6, 13 through 16 says in the message translation, be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can. Get every weapon God has issued so that when it's all over, but the shouting you'll still be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than words. Learn how to apply them. Those are some of the weapons that God has given us. You know, the devil is always trying to throw us into a pit. And with the death of our child, he succeeded in throwing us into a pretty deep one. And then he lies to us trying to tell us that we can never get out. Don't believe the lies of Satan that you will never get out of this dark pit that he has thrown you into and that life will never be worth living again. God is no respecter of persons. I know you've heard that. And what he does for one person, he will do for anybody. The promises of God are for all of us. So if you know of even one person who has been able to get out of that place after the death of their child, you can get there too. And let me be that one person. There are thousands of us, but let me be that one. And let me say it again. You can be there too. You may feel like giving up, but I want to remind you of the victory Jesus gained for us through his death on the cross and then the power of his resurrection. These have got to become more than just words for us. They have to become the empowering life that God intended this to be for each one of us. Have you heard the story about a donkey who fell into a deep pit? The owner decided the donkey was so old that it was not going to be worth the work and the effort to get him out of that pit. So he asked a couple of neighbors to help him throw dirt into the pit to just bury the poor thing. At first, the donkey sounded very pitiful as they shoveled in the dirt, but then it got quiet. They figured it had already died, and they kept shoveling in the dirt to finish burying the animal. The men did not realize that as they threw the dirt down on the donkey, it would shake the dirt off its back and get on top of it. As they threw down more dirt, the donkey would shake it off and get on top of it. That old donkey did it long enough, refusing to give up, until eventually he was able to climb out of the pit on top of what was supposed to put him under. Jesus is an expert at getting people out of the pit they find themselves thrown into by the enemy. The good shepherd, Jesus himself, said that he will leave the 99 for the one. And if you are the one, He is coming for you to get you out of your place of darkness. No matter what pit you get thrown into, if you are a man or woman of God, he can pull you out and lift you up to a place 
you never thought was possible at this point. God will even use the exact thing the enemy tried to use to take you under to pull you back up in a way, like I said, that you didn't expect. After all, God brought Jesus out of the grave after snatching the keys of hell and death from the enemy who put him in the grave. His life gives life, not just eternal life with him in heaven someday, but life to us after we feel like we died when our child died. Because he lives, we can live, and we can learn to live a life of victory over death until we join our child. Joseph was someone who went from a pit to a palace. His jealous brothers had thrown him into a pit with plans to kill him, but instead they ended up selling him as a slave to a passing caravan going to a whole different country. But God was at work in Joseph's life for many years to the point where he became second in command to the Pharaoh of the strongest nation on earth at that time. When Joseph's brothers were forced to go to him and grovel at his feet to beg for food for their families in a time of famine, they did not realize this was their brother. But Joseph's response in Genesis 50, 20, I mean, he could have been extremely bitter, had them thrown in prison, had them executed, just turned them away, whatever. But his response can be our response as well to the one who put us in our pit. What you meant for evil and harm, God intended for good that I may be in a position to, now we're not going to have the same position to that Joseph had of, you know, keeping God's people alive through a famine. And you probably don't even know what that position is yet, but you can still fill in the blank with something like that I may be in a position to kick your devil backside big time someday, right? So go ahead, let him know right now that you are not staying down there in the pit that he threw you into. And then give the Holy Spirit permission to work his resurrection power, the same power that raised Christ from the dead, that he will be at work with that same power in your life to get you out of that pit. I know you're thinking, why didn't he use that to stop my child from dying? Why? doesn't help us right now. The question really is how. How am I going to get through this? How am I going to get out of this darkness? How is God going to somehow do what he did for Joseph to turn this around so that I can be in a position to whatever it is that takes down the enemy in a way that kind of makes him pay, I guess, for what he did to your child and my child. Psalm 40 verse 2 says, he lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and he steadied me as I walked along. And this is possible because he lives and he lives inside you. His resurrection power is inside you to bring you back to life. Now, I have a lot of my friends that say that fall is their favorite season of the year. And I do love fall with all of its splendor in the north when the trees turn all of those beautiful colors. It can be absolutely breathtaking. But for me, spring is my favorite season, which is coming up real fast here. I love watching what looked old and dead come into full life with so much green and watching an endless array of beautiful, colorful flowers begin to blossom. Have you noticed in the springtime how things seem to have their own timeline to bloom? Some growth comes out right away and others take a lot longer, even making us wonder if it's going to happen at all. And this can be like our grief. We all feel like winter has come into our lives. And the further north you live, the more you experience what that's like. Nothing grows. Everything is brown and drab. And it seemed to go on and on like it will never end. But spring always returns. Some years, it's later than others, but it happens. 
Little green buds start coming out on the trees. The grass goes from brown to green. Farmers start planting their fields and you start seeing those little shoots rise up from that brown dirt in the field. Flowers around us start to bloom. Birds are here. They, they start singing and we start seeing butterflies and bees. Many years ago, when Dave and I first got married, there was a bush in our front yard that normally had these beautiful, deep pink flowers on it. But for a couple of years, it stopped blooming and it looked like it was dying. So toward the end of summer one year, I chopped it down to basically nothing and waited for spring. To my amazement, it grew back and it was full of more beautiful flowers than it had ever been in the years before. You may feel like you have been chopped down to nothing and will never bloom again. You may think you will live the rest of your life feeling like it's winter, but spring always comes. Your life isn't over. It may take a while, but there is still life in you to be lived and it can and will be beautiful again. How do I know that? Because you have the seed of hope living in you and because of what Jesus did for you. Isaiah 53 verses 3 through 5 is familiar. Let me read it to you. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. He was pierced for our rebellion and crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Let me share one more scripture with you. It's Hosea chapter 6, verse 3. Oh, that we might know the Lord. Let us press on to know him. He will respond to us as surely as the arrival of dawn or the coming of rains in early spring. God's resurrection power is at work in you. Just like you can't see the work being done in a seat under the ground, you may not be able to feel or see God at work in you, but that's okay. One day it will break through and you will start to see and feel the warmth and the beauty of life around you again. There is hope in God's resurrection power, not just at work in Jesus over 2,000 years ago, but in your child and in you right now. Are you working on a writing project that you're struggling to finish? Join a group of us on a virtual writer's retreat. Whether you need to complete a book manuscript, a series of emails, articles, social or, or blog posts, maybe you want to write a book, whatever. If it's important to you and you would like to invest some focused time with other writers working on our own projects, block off April 9th through the 11th to join us. Now, first, let me say it's free to join this virtual writer's retreat. It's virtual, so you don't have to go anywhere. You can do it right where you are. And it is for authors who want to complete an important or urgent writing project with grace-based accountability, celebrations, and some training interactions in between there. It is virtual, like I said, 100% online. It's a three-day focused writing retreat where writers will crank out content to meet a deadline or a commitment. Maybe it's your own self-commitment to something that you want to get done or you want to start. You'll have solo work segments, time to work on your project, with 15-minute high-intensity training segments with multi-published authors between those times of writing. It's one thing to get advice from an author. It's a whole other thing to get advice from authors who keep producing books that sell multiple books, and I am blessed to be one of those who will be giving a 15-minute talk at this writer's retreat called Embrace God's Timing. You choose the project you want to work on. You decide how many days you can attend. You decide on your commitment level within each day, and we provide those of us doing the virtual writer's retreat, like I said, the grace-based accountability plus the high-intensity training, the HIT sessions, 
with experienced and successful multi-published authors. My personal friend and mentor, Marnie Swedberg, is putting this together. The link to take a look at it to see who the other authors are, who will be doing the hit sessions, and to register, see the link in the show notes. One more thing here. In our online store, we have shirts with the saying, hold on, pain eases, there is hope. There's sweatshirts, hoodies. I love my zip-up sweatshirt. It's great for this time of year. You walk out the door when it's chilly, but the day warms up. We also have long sleeve t-shirts, short sleeve t-shirts, moisture wicking t-shirts, and even a baseball t-shirt. There are lots of colors and sizes. If you want to see them, go to gpshope.org, click on the store tab, and then on the Hope merchandise. I'll put a link to that in the show notes that will take you directly to that page if you want to use that link to see all the different Hope shirts. Let's go ahead with our birthday segment this week. There is only one this week that's a bit unusual. Jermaine Mitchell was born on March 26 and is forever 31. We celebrate the day he came into this world along with his family. If you would like to have your child's birthday announced the week of his or her birthday, all you have to do is go to gpshope.org slash birthdays. It will send you to where you can fill out the needed information, hit submit, and I will announce your child's birthday that week. Dave will also send you an email to remind you to listen. And also his email will tell you if you want to have your child announced the following year, you need to fill out the form again. Going back to 1 Corinthians 15, 55, the verse that says, Death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your victory? Our children have already had the sting of death removed from them. They are no longer affected by the dark things of this world. When I join my daughter and you join your child or children, we will be able to look down at Satan and laugh at him because we will be able to say, Death, where is your sting? I don't have any of it now and you can't get me with it anymore. And when I think about it, why should we wait? Why not tell the devil that right now? I want you to say this after me. Satan, I may feel the sting of death now, but you don't have the final word in my life or my child's life. That stinger has already been pulled from my child. And someday it will be pulled from me as well. When that happens, I will be dancing in victory with my child and with Jesus, who defeated you for all of eternity when he died and went to hell, snatching the keys of death from you and walked out from the grave to remain alive forever. I may not feel like rejoicing right now about the day God will take away the sting of death from me, but I will someday. Until then, I choose to thank Him for this amazing gift that is mine to receive when my time here is over. Yeah, did that feel good? I hope so. 1 Corinthians 15, 54. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. If you feel like you just can't go to church Sunday for Easter service, It's okay. It's okay if you stay home from an Easter church service. But if you do, please make sure you spend some time with him, thanking him for the gift of being able to be with your child again because of his death and resurrection. You can even take communion. I do that. 
I was going to share some things to help you over the hurdle if you believe either you can't serve yourself communion or you believe you would be disobeying and bringing judgment on yourself if you took the elements right now because of where your heart is. But I realized that that needs to be its own podcast topic and episode. And I might do that next week. We'll see how the Holy Spirit leads. But ask God to make that resurrection power real to you by giving you life again. That would be a miracle, wouldn't it? But that is one of God's specialties, the miracle of bringing life from death. And that can be celebrated anytime, any place, with other believers or by yourself. But remember to celebrate and thank God for the resurrection power. So with that, remember to hold on. Pain eases. There is hope.